Jesus who gathers us in for this time of worship and praise. Welcome to Westminster, an affirming ministry in the United Church of Canada. So glad to have all of you with us this morning, um, in person here and online as well. And if it's your first visit with us, a special welcome goes out to you. Uh, I'll start with celebrations. Who's got a celebration? Linda. Sarah and Andrew celebrated their sixth wedding anniversary yesterday. I was thinking of you the word there. <laughs> six years already. Sarah and Andrew, six years. And Catherine and Lauren, how many years? Six. Six? Oh, that was the same year. Right. A week after. Right, right. <laughs> Jason. Aurora is their 58th. 58th anniversary wow. for Espo and Diane. <laughs> church you need an alarm code so don't open that door unless you know an alarm code it's very loud uh, and it goes off quickly um, but to into the vestibule that is not tied to the alarm system and there's lots of tools and goodies in there pretty much everything you would need so thank you and come and speak to us um, if if you need some instructions that's it from So my only other announcement is that <clears throat> next week, wow, next week is going to be something. We've got five baptisms. Oh, wow. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Isn't that awesome? So, you know how we like to write cards for the, the, the children being baptized? On that table over where Kathy is, there is a list of all the, the five names of the people being baptized, and there are cards and envelopes there. So if you like, you can get started this week. Do a couple this week, a couple next week, do them all today, whatever you like. If you want to write cards, they are over there, um, cards and envelopes, and the names are on the list. So I'll leave you to that after uh, our worship is done. Other announcements? Yes, here's the season of not maybe announcing, and that's okay. Let's celebrate God's presence in our midst. Let's worship. We begin by acknowledging that the land on which we worship this morning is land that has been walked on, hunted on, and lived on for thousands of years. It is the traditional and abiding territory of the Anishinaabe and the ancestral territory of the Tsotlalin First Nation. The Métis Nation also has a long history in our region. We 
We acknowledge with gratitude the good stewardship of this land from generation to generation, and we're grateful for the beauty and the abundance that surround us. May we always remember the story of this land and our call to live upon it with respect, humility, and gratitude. We like this special. No, you're not. There we go. We like this special candle to remember all the children who suffered and died in Indian residential schools. And we like this candle, the Christ candle, to remember that the light of Jesus shines in and through each of us. gather now for worship. To bring praise and worship to God. To rest in God's loving embrace. In prayer and praise. In worship and We are strengthened and our spirits are renewed. Let's worship together. Let's begin with prayer. God, we know that our faith is part of a larger story. Through the stories of our ancestors, and recorded over time. Your way and your will for us is revealed. Guide us as we worship today so that our own stories may continue the long tradition of sharing the gospel in the name of Jesus. Amen. So our focus this morning is going to be on the sacraments and in particular on the sacrament of communion. So let's pray. Wondrous God, the table is set for the feast this morning. We see once again the invitation of Jesus to meet him in the bread and the cup, to circle around the blessing of the table and remember him. Bless each of us as we come to the table with hands and hearts open to receive your grace. In the name of Jesus, amen.
chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. And I'm reading from the Common English Bible. I received a tradition from the Lord, which I also handed on to you. On the night on which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. After giving thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. <coughs> Do this to remember me. He did the same thing with the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, do this to remember me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you broadcast the death of the Lord until he comes. Our second reading is from Psalm 139, verses 1 to 10, 13, and 14. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. <clears throat> you know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my words, all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. For it was you who formed my inward parts, you who knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that I know very well. Our gospel reading for this morning is from Luke chapter 22, verses 7 through 20, also from the Common English Bible. The day of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover had to be sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John with this task. Go, excuse me, go and prepare for us to eat the Passover meal. They said to him, where do you want us to prepare it? Jesus replied, when you go into the city, a man carrying a water jar will meet you. Follow him to the house. He enters. Say to the owner of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs already furnished. Make preparations there. They went and found everything just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. When the time came, Jesus took his place at the table, and the apostles joined him. He said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I tell you, I won't eat it until it is fulfilled in God's kingdom. After taking a cup and giving thanks, he said, take this 
and share it among yourselves. I tell you that from now on, I won't drink from the fruit of the vine until God's kingdom has come. After taking the bread and giving thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after the meal and said, This cup is the new covenant by my blood, which is poured out for you. This is the witness of God's people. Thanks be to God. by the United Church of Canada to a, min a ministry of word, sacrament, and pastoral care. And that ordination happened in a circus tent, which I've told you about before, but I'll share that again in a few weeks. But for now, I thought over the next three Sundays, I would talk a little bit about each of those areas of ministry. And I'll do them out of order, since today we are sharing Holy Communion, I'll talk about sacraments today. A quick reminder that um, a sacrament is best described as it was so long ago by St. Augustine as a visible sign of an invisible grace. In other words, it's a physical, tangible sign of God's goodness. So let's start with the notion of an open table. Here at Westminster, as many of you know, we have an open table where no one is left out. No one is barred from receiving the elements in remembrance of Jesus. I think it's fair to say that most United Churches across Canada share an open table, but I'm sure there are some who do not. The Reverend Nadia Bowles Weber points out accurately, I believe, that Jesus himself had an open table. Throughout the Gospels, he dined with many who were seen as unworthy of respect, never mind being worthy of sharing a meal with a popular itinerant minister. Jesus dined with tax collectors, fishermen, soldiers, and lawyers, all of whom had sketchy reputations. Maybe not the fishermen so much, but the rest. But perhaps the most notorious meal he shared was with his own disciples in that upper room during the Passover. Artists have depicted that gathering as the Last Supper with all at the table in beautiful, friendly companionship. And in some ways, I suppose that's what it was. But if you think about it, one person at that table already knows he is going to betray Jesus. He already has. He took the 30 pieces of silver. The rest of the disciples, though they do not know it yet, will only hours later abandon Jesus and deny even knowing him. And yet, Jesus speaks the words and blesses the meal and does not deny any of them the bread and the cup. Each is handed the bread. Each partakes of the cup. And all he asks of them is this, remember me. It is no different for us today. We come to the table as we are, with open hands and open hearts, and we do so in remembrance of Jesus, who turns no one away. It was once the case in many, if not most, United Churches that only those who had been baptized and confirmed in the faith could receive communion. 
as if there were some order to the power of God's grace, as if God were checking rites of passage off some divine list with our names on them. Now I used to think there was something quite lovely about confirmation as a process of preparing young people for approaching the table. But I don't see it that way at all anymore. Rather, I see us as a family coming to the table together for a feast. And we would no more deny a child access to this table than we would deny them access to our own family Thanksgiving or Christmas dinner. The rationale back in the day to making children and young adults wait for communion was mostly about their being too young to understand what was happening. That reasoning does not hold up under theological scrutiny because none of us actually understand what happens in the mystery of the sacrament. For 24 years, I have presided at this table where I've broken the bread and poured the cup and shared. I've held up the elements and I've spoken those words of institution and then prayed for God to send the Holy Spirit into our midst so that in some mysterious way, by the Spirit, Jesus is with us as we share. I have no clearer idea today of what happens in that moment or how Jesus is present to us in the bread and the cup than I did in 1998 when I was ordained, than I did at the age of 16 when I first received communion. I only know that something shifts. Something within me is transformed. Something shifts ever so slightly in the air, in the space, where the bread and the cup are being shared. Something shifts in the universe. What happens in that moment is a mystery to me, a sacred mystery. And what my lack of clarity tells me is that regardless of age or intellect or experience, we all come to this table as equals. <coughs> None of us knows with any certainty what's happening. We're simply invited to be held in the goodness of it all. I believe the sacraments are not mysteries to be unraveled by some kind of theological Agatha Christie detective. The mystery of the sacraments is just that mystery and will remain as such. The other aspect of the sacrament I'd like to reflect on a bit this morning is the way in which communion brings our faith to life in real time. It's one of the ways in which our inner life of the spirit is transformed into action. Week by week, we gather for worship. And let's face it, we hear a lot of words in prayers, hymns, scripture, and sermons. And nestled in all of those words, a common thread that runs through all of it, is a message of hope. And it's meant to strengthen our faith and send us out filled with the sense that there is something to be done. That God's love and compassion is not only ours by God's grace, but also our responsibility to share. Worship at its best is a place to refuel your soul so that your faith becomes more than what happens in your mind and in your spirit. It becomes a life of sacred action that in no small measure actually heals the world. The act of receiving communion is one of those sacred actions. You see, Jesus understood 
that we would need something more than an idea of him to truly remember him. So here we are. The table is set with good bread and grape juice. And in these fruits of the earth, we need him. When we engage and participate in the sacrament, we are embodying <coughs> our faith. Our bodies, which the psalmist reminds us are fearfully and wonderfully made, our bodies are proclaiming our faith. By participating in communion, we are saying, Jesus, with my body, I praise you. With my body, I take this bread and I take this cup and I am fully present in the mystery of this feast. And as a community of faith, we are also present to one another. There's a part of our communion liturgy that says, therefore we join our voices with all your people in every time and every place, singing praises to your holy name. And I'm especially aware this morning of that part of the liturgy. Today as we share, I'm remembering the communion of saints who have gone before us. And I'm grateful to lift up the bread and cup for them as well. The sacraments connect us to all the generations that have shared this meal before us. Ever since that night, Jesus joined with his friends and said, remember me. But that connection through time means that this morning, we also share this feast with one another and with those whom we have loved and now miss. In my mind this morning, I'm seeing Mary and George Webb, Francis, John, Kitty, Wayne, Ed, and Gail, and Scott, and all of them. And I'm imagining seeing them picking up the bread off the tray in the way we used to serve, and dipping it in the cup, and partaking, and saying a thank you, or an amen, or maybe nothing at all, and moving back to their seats. They're all here with and I imagine them all joyfully singing along with us in that final hymn after the communion and greeting all of us after the blessing in the only way that they can by touching our memories and our hearts and our spirits. To gather as we do around this table, to share bread and cup together is, as Beth Fraser once said, either a fool's dream or a declaration of outrageous hope. I believe it is the latter, that our participation at the table is an act of outrageous hope. And I believe that such hope is our best way forward. The hope you embody when you take that bread and drink that cup is hope that will nourish your faith build you up as church together, and strengthen you for whatever lies ahead. So today let's gather around this table and remember and embody the outrageous hope of the gospel.
presentation of our offering. Holy One, we pray that our gifts, given in faith, may be seeds of new hope for all in need. With grateful hearts, we dedicate our offering in the name of Jesus. Amen. So before we move into um, the sacrament of Holy Communion, uh, just a few prayer requests. I'll ask for continued prayers for Donna, who remains in hospital, and uh, for Roberta and her partner Steve, who are in a, a time of transition as Steve is uh, hospitalized for assessment of um, hope and strength in his care. Are there other requests this morning? Ken. Prayers for my friend Bruce. For Bruce. Jason. Prayer, prayers for Alex. Prayers for Alex. For Yvonne and Bob Roth, who are having some health issues. For Yvonne and Bob Roth, who are having some health issues. all the prayers of our hearts into the week ahead of us. So I think I covered the invitation. <laughs> the whole sermon was kind of a great big invitation to the table. So we'll move on with the great Thanksgiving prayer. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Great is your tenderness, God, for all that you have made. You are good, and all that you have made is good. Your love and your grace are revealed in creation, and for this we are grateful. We bear witness to your wonders and give thanks for the ministry we share together. By water and the word, you make us your own, and by the spirit, you call us into the world. We see glimmers of hope everywhere, in the morning sun and the glory of a moonlit night, in the calm peace after a storm, in the richness of being among the trees. We come home to you in bread laid out on a plate and the fruit of the vine shared among friends. In the mystery of these moments, the veil disappears and we are united once again 
with you and with each other by the power of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we join our voices with all your people in every time, every place, and every language, singing praises to your holy name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Go down in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Go down in the highest. Holy are you, wondrous God, and blessed is Jesus Christ, who is your heart. When he could have wandered the streets of glory, he searched instead to find us, bringing healing and hope to all people. When he doubted anything good might come of his humility and sacrifice, he called us to follow him and to see for ourselves the power of your love. When he could have shunned the cross, he instead confronted death itself and was raised to new life glorifying you and sealing your promise. He lived out the fullness of your grace. We saw his holy love. We trust the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Gracious God, send your spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and cup so that everyone who eats and drinks at this table might be one in Christ's body, light, life, and love in our world. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, God most holy, now and forevermore. Scripture tells us that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus sat to meals with his good friends for one last time. And when he had given thanks to God, he broke the bread. And he showed it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Every time you share it in this way, do it in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after he had given thanks to God, he poured the cup and he showed it to his friends saying, this cup holds the sign of the new covenant established by my suffering and dying. Every time you share it this way, do it in remembrance of me. And so it is that we come together now to share and to remember. bread of life. The cup of hope.
Will you join with me, please, in the prayer after communion? We thank you, God, for breaking into our world and pouring the abundance of your Spirit into our lives. Bless us as we go from here, nourished in our faith and ready to serve you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 